Minister for Infrastructure. Um, question 11 has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, question number one, please. Following my meeting on the 3rd of August with a new taxi group established in the north, I made clear my intention to deal as quickly as possible with this legacy issue. It is vital that there is clarity for both consumers and those in the taxi industry on the way forward, and my decision to instruct officials to commence work immediately on a review demonstrates my commitment to finally putting in place a taxi industry that fully meets the needs of the consumers here. I have also been aware that rumours are being spread amongst taxi operators and drivers that the requirement to have an approved meter and printer is being scrapped. Let me reiterate that this is not the case, and the legislative requirement to have an approved meter and printer installed in all Class A and Class B taxis remains in place. My officials have also commenced work to set up a taxi forum, which will include statutory bodies, stakeholders from across the taxi industry and consumer groups. This group will help inform the content of the review and how it will be progressed. I trust that members of the House, those in the taxi industry and other key stakeholders are now left in no doubt that I intend to ensure at the end of the review process we will have in place a taxi industry which fully meets the needs of local people and those that visit this part of Ireland. Sammy Douglas for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his uh, answer. Would the Minister agree with me with the, the importance of communicating um, back to those taxi drivers and also the operators um, the changes that um, are uh, proposed? And obviously, there is an October deadline for some of these um, taxi drivers as well. Maybe the Minister would respond to that. I thank the member for his supplementary, and I agree entirely. I was very clear in the summer when I met those operators, and I, I went to the public to, to lay out my concerns of the legacy issues that we, we took in place. Um, I was very clear today. I think that the people will understand that the date is still in place. There will be no more further periods of grace. Uh, I will be meeting uh, with officials in the morning uh, to discuss uh, enforcement issues, and for those people who, by no fault of their own, have not been able to get a meter in place, uh, given the huge scale of those people applying, the, the best way forward. But let the message be very, very clear. Meter and printers will be part of our taxi industry as we go forward. Nicola Mallon. I call Nicola Mallon. Can I record my apologies that last week I wasn't in my seat when I was called for a topical for health, so apologies for that. Um, could I ask the Minister, could he outline how changes to legislation may impact on the operation of Uber in the Greater Belfast area? I do not intend uh, to take any specific action in relation to any particular industry such as Uber. Just like every other taxi operator in the north, Uber must adhere to the law. I understand that they and some other taxi drivers have adopted to select Class C licenses for at least some of their taxis, as I intend to take action to ensure the scope of the Class C license reflects the original policy intentions of all the class. All those using Class C will have to ensure that they comply with the requirements of Class C. I call Mervyn Storey. I to thank the Minister for his answer so far. Will the Minister give an assurance that he will uh, look at the issue particularly of new taxi drivers uh, wanting to uh, set the examination that is, is placed there because uh, if he speaks to his officials he'll be aware that I've had meetings recently with officials in relation to this and appreciate the help that they've given. But there is a concern that the current process that we have in place to ensure that the system is open and transparent is not working in the best way that possibly I could. The member a question. That's a very and will question. will the, the, the Minister look at the issue of the uh, test to ensure that taxi drivers are being given the appropriate test and for the best possible outcome? And before I call the Minister, can I ask members to uh, make their questions brief? Uh, I agree entirely. Uh, it is one of the issues that I discussed with the uh, industry stakeholders. I believe there is also an employment opportunity here, if, if got right. I think there are some small changes that, that can be taken on board, and it is something my officials are currently looking at. Declan McAleer. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, last can call you. And the Minister clearly is aware that um, the Class C uh, the, use of the misuse of the Class C license is causing a great deal of grievance amongst many taxi operators. Can you tell us um, what specifically or what steps he, can, he has taken to address the issue of the Class C license? Margaret. 
I am very aware of concerns around uh, how Class C licence has been adopted um, and what might be termed normal taxis. The Class C licence was designed for use by special or novelty vehicles such as limousines, wedding cars and other novelty vehicles. It was not intended for use by normal taxis. As a result, I have instructed officials to examine the issue with a view to keeping the scope with the Class C licence where it was intended to be in the Taxis Act and expect action to be taken in the very near future to achieve this. Gordon Mugget. Stuart Dixon. Uh, Deputy uh, Speaker, and to thank the Minister for his answer so far, and he has in part answered the question with regards to uh, vintage wedding cars on drivers. Given the mess left behind by the previous minister, will he guarantee in this mandate that he will resolve this issue and sort out the nonsense that was left behind? I thank the member uh, for, for his comments, and I am certainly determined uh, to do the best that I can to ensure that we have a taxi industry going forward that meets the needs not only of the industry but consumers alike. Uh, and I think, in partnership with my officials, uh, with the new taxi stakeholder group, that is something that is very much achievable in the time ahead. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question two. My department has a major emergency response plan which provides the overarching framework for the strategic management and coordination of a major emergency such as significant flooding. There are close working relationships across government in the area of flood management, and I am keen to see those enhanced going forward. These should be further strengthened now that the three organisations involved with flood management, DFI Rivers, NI Water and Transport NI, are now all within my department. My department is the lead government department for the coordination of the emergency response to flooding, and this enables other organisations to be made aware of the risks which allow them to be prepared to react to a flood event. DFI Rivers, NI Water and Transport NI all have specific arrangements to deal with flood emergencies, and these include liaison with the Met Office, placing staff on standby, managing their drainage assets during a flood event, and carrying out preventative maintenance to grills. The flooding incident line is also available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to facilitate public requests for assistance. By working together across government and with communities, we can be better prepared for flood events in the future. Sydney Anderson for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Minister, for your answer. Uh, Minister, you will be aware of the damage and devastation suffered by my constituents and businesses uh, in Upper Band that was caused by flooding over the New Year period, specifically along the Loch Shore at the Kennegan Marina and also in the Mahri uh, Burgess area of Portadown. What assurances and comfort can you give to those people, those businesses and those rural dwellers that if we were to have a similar or worse situation developing this year and further into the future, that there is sufficient contingency plans put in place to help ensure that it does not take place? Well, the member will be very aware, of course, that it's not a matter of if but it's when, when we're dealing with major flooding incidents. With climate change uh, and the very nature of weather, uh, it's not something that we can stop, but it's something we have to manage. Uh, the member will also be aware of the Alan Strong Review, uh, who, you know, a highly acclaimed civil engineer, who, who has compiled a very extensive and detailed report that I am due to see shortly, which will, I have no doubt, plot out uh, the pitfalls and the strengths of not only the 2015-16 uh, winter floods, but the best roadmap on going forward. Uh, and I look forward to receiving that report shortly, uh, and no doubt the member will have an interest in that too. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Thank you. Can I also thank you for the money that was made available to County Fermanagh, uh, Transport NI, to Transport NI and County Fermanagh for help towards alleviating some of the flooding. However, I'd like to know what extra finances were allocated directly to Rivers Agency in their quest to alleviate future flooding through managing the drainage system. I thank the member very much for her question and her kind regards. I'm actually travelling to Fulmana this week to have a look at some of the remedial work that's taken place uh, to future-proof uh, some of the transport corridors, some of the roads and infrastructure in Fermanagh that was badly hit, uh, uh, as you've made reference to. Uh, I don't have the specific financial information in front of me, but I'm more than happy to correspond with the member in that regard. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what arrangements are in place uh, to communicate with local government? Gormil Mug. In response to significant flooding is necessary, council-led sub-regional emergency preparedness groups, meetings or conference calls can set up a team to provide interagency coordination for those involved in the response. 
These forums provide wider situational awareness, inform mutual decision making, facilitate the easy exchange of information and coordinate the multi-agency response across the affected areas. I call Robin Swan. Road safety is one of my department's key priorities, and in light of the recent fatalities along this stretch of road, Transport NI carried out a review of safety in consultation with the PSNI, looking at the collision history and the causation factors identified. This review made a number of recommendations, which are now being followed through. My department is currently consulting on proposals to prohibit right turns out of Wood Green Road, Main Road and Cromkill Road onto the A26 Les Navina Road. I understand that there are some objections to these proposals which will have to be addressed. This will delay progress for a number of months and could potentially prevent the prohibitions being implemented. Some work has already been completed to renew white lines and junctions and provide new direction arrows. New warning and direction signage has also been designed and procured and is expected to be installed before the winter season. The remaining works to renew advanced direction signs, warning signs, cat size and lines and cut back vegetation growth are currently planned to begin shortly and continue over the following months. Robin Swan for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his update. The Minister then, I'm sure, with that detailed response, will be aware specifically of the Wood Green Junction and the work that's needed done there, which experiences a disproportionately high number for ta of fatalities per road accidents and also for traffic movements. Can I ask him, I know he said that some of the responses or some of the proposals from his department have met objections that's holding back the road, but could he also not maybe acknowledge that they aren't objections, but merely responses to the consultation that his department asked for, where locals have input what they think may be a better fit. I thank the, the member for, for his answer, and I take on board his comments. And certainly when we go out to consultation, we, we want to ensure, and I'm very adamant about this, that road safety is a priority for us. We want to take on board everything that has been said during that consultation uh, project. But it's something, and we need to bear this in mind. When there are objections in place, we have to look at them. We have a legislative duty to do so. But I'm more than happy to meet or to correspond with the member in this regard in the future. Aaron or Jerry Mullen. The new road has been diverted west. So can you update us on, as to what will happen to the old road now and the surrounding land about, around that area? Thanks very much for the question from the member. Uh, I'm not actually aware of the road that he's referring to and I don't have that information in front of me, but certainly more than happy to correspond with the member in that regard. I call Paul through. Madam uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister has already outlined the fact that there is, is, the Department is, is uh, consulting with some of the objectors uh, and I have facilitated some meetings with uh, officials from Transport NI, uh, NI. One of the concerns I have is that they're meeting with individual uh, objectors as opposed to doing it in a public setting and a, a public meeting whereby you may be able to address more of the concerns quicker has the in, a, in order that this would be placed on the ground as quickly as possible for I fear there could be more fatalities Minister would the Minister give assurance that this will be on the ground as quickly as possible thank the member and the member should rest be rest assured that you know we want to get to the, the same place and as quickly as possible but you know I have to put on record that if the objections are not withdrawn, it's likely that the proposals will be subject to a public inquiry. So you will very much have that, uh, the, the public sphere. But the, the only outcome of that, of course, is you're going to delay the implementation of the scheme by at least a year. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. It's over 18 months since the sad fatality of the young married woman at Woodgreen Cross gave rise to this review. Yet 18 months on, we're still being having the excuses of why action can't yet take place. Has the member is there question? no urgency with the department in addressing this issue? Has the member, and why has the it not been costed and taken so long to take? to the minister rather than make a statement. I thank the member for his comments. And if the member will review Hansard, he will, he will see that I have laid out a number of uh, programmes and schemes that will take place to address some of the concerns. Uh, I am very much want to see a successful conclusion in this. I want the conclusion that makes these roads safer for road users. I call David Ford. Thank you, Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his response to Mr Swan's question? 
Having a one occasion rendered first aid at a thankfully not quite fatal accident at uh, Wood Green, I endorse everything he said. But there are also other junctions further south, particularly um, at Tanakhmore and Criavery within the Antrim area, which are almost equally bad. And is any action being taken with respect to them? The member for his uh, question, and uh, again, where I'm not in, in, in great detail with in front of me here today of the specific junctions, uh, I know that a, a review has taken place over the length of it. I have no doubt that officials have been looking at this, uh, and if this is something the member wants to correspond with me, I'd be more than happy to do so. I call William Humphrey. Can I ask the minister question number four? Historically, the Blue Badge Unit carried a number of agency staff to assist with the application processing. However, in December 2014, due to a ministerial directive, all temporary staff contracts were terminated as a cost-saving measure. This created a backlog that was not addressed until July 2015, when agency staff were rec recruited. The unit lost staff under VES in December 2015, January and March 2016. These staff have not been replaced. The estimated number of blue badges in circulation in 2016 will be over 125,000. Application numbers have increased dramatically since the introduction of PIP earlier this year. The Department had expected to link the Blue Badge Service in Britain in April 2016, but no provision was made to allow us locally to access that contract. The situation has now been resolved and is hoped that we will be allowed to access the service in April 2017. That situation has meant that the Department had to locally procure new blank badges to enable them to continue processing. The new blank badges arrived on 7 July 2016 and the process of issuing those held up in the backlog began immediately. Five agency staff are currently employed processing blue badge applications, with another, with another one due to start next week. There are approximately 9,900 applications to be processed. Preference is being given to the first-time applications, whilst other cases are dealt with in date order. Applicants that hold an expired badge and have sent in renewal applications are being advised that traffic attendants on street and in council car parks will not issue parking tickets to any badge displayed that has expired after the 1st of May 2016. This information is also available to the public on the NI Direct website. Organisations with responsibilities for disseminating information to hospitals and businesses, including private car park operators, have also been informed about the situation and will be re-notified again in mid-September. I call William Humphrey for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer. Uh, Minister, you will be aware that I wrote to you as Chair of the Committee last week and the Committee discussed this, this issue and there was unanimous agreement around the Committee on, on the issue and the, the, the unacceptable situation that currently prevails in Northern Ireland. Can I just say that um, my constituent who wrote to me, Elaine, has uh, actually submitted her application on the 4th of August and has been told she won't get it until the 17th of November. You know, this is really affecting people negatively in Northern Ireland, people who really need to have the ability to park in a disabled space. It is life-limiting for those people. Can I ask the Minister to do what he can? I appreciate there's extra resource. To do what he can to address this it simply isn't good enough. I thank the member for his question and for the interest that the committee have shown uh, in this issue. Uh, I agree with your sentiments. It's something that we need to get, uh, to get through. It's something I, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel, as I have outlined, uh, April 2017. Uh, but the message must go out, and I think it has gone out, uh, that you know, people will not be punished, that if the applications have expired, uh, that they won't be punished for that. Uh, and certainly I'm more than happy to look at those cases that have fallen foul of that. I call Fran McCann. Uh, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answers thus far. And I, I do welcome the fact that uh, many people who have got tickets uh, up today, uh, when their applications had been in, they welcome that news today. Uh, but I would ask him, and it's been partially answered to, uh, to the, 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 the last member, but uh, is it possible that we could get a constituency by constituency breakdown uh, at some time in the near future uh, of uh, the, the, what areas actually have all the badges in terms of the constituency? Thank the member for his question. Uh, I, certainly, I have not seen a consistency, consistency breakdown, but I'm more than happy to chase that up. We're dealing with a situation here where we have approximately 200 applicants per day. Uh, we're anecdotally in 1999. You're looking at a situation of 12,500 blue badges. You know the estimated figure, as I've outlined already today, is 125,000. Uh, you know there are many reasons for this huge surge in blue badge applications, but it's certainly a problem that I want to get, get through and get to the other side of. Kelly Armstrong. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, 
Can I ask the Minister what consideration has been given or could he give to a customer care charter that confirms that no person with disabilities will have to make more than 30 days for their blue badge to be processed in the future? Uh, certainly, it's a, it's a new idea to me. I'm more than happy to give a consideration if the member wants to correspond with me on it. I call Jenny Palmer. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive uh, report on the issue of the delay in the blue badges. Uh, Minister, um, I, I hope that you'll agree with me in terms of uh, the, if, a, if a current badge holder and the badge has expired and your interventions um, have allowed that um, they won't be punished for it, that doesn't apply across the border, so therefore anyone who's travelling across the border cannot use that blue badge. Um, effectively without being punished in another jurisdiction. And I, I just wonder, Minister, are we, have we got the resource that, in place now to make sure that the delays will not be longer than the 30 days? Well, I thank the member for a supplementary question, and I, I, I welcome the Ulster Unionist Party's all-Ireland all approach to this issue. Uh, I, I think it is to be welcomed. Um, look, I, I'm more than happy to take this up with counterparts uh, in Dublin. I, I think this is an issue, as you say, that uh, has maybe suffered from unintended consequences of, of other initiatives. Uh, you know, 200 applications a day for no matter what size of a team is a huge amount of work to get through. Uh, but as I've outlined to, to the members on the other side, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel here. And I think we, as we progress through this, uh, the backlog will be eaten through considerably. Ian Mill. I call Ian Mill. Quick, question number five. This important project has a number of aims to transfer, transform public transport and deliver customer growth in line with a key programme for Government Indicator, to deliver an innovative ticketing system with a focus on integration, flexibility and convenience, and to develop and deliver replacement ticketing equipment and associated systems nearing the end of their useful life while modernising with additional operational, technical and customer-led enhancements. Ticketing requirements for the new Belfast Rapid Transit system will also be delivered through this project. Customers using concessionary fares will continue to avail of this in the new system. The new modern ticketing system will be equipped with wider ranging functionality and capabilities and will be scalable to allow for integration with other operators. Some of the key benefits expected include improved bus boarding times, reduced use of cash, improved data and communication channels, integrated travel and rewards for regular passengers, as well as simplified and more accessible ticketing for customers. I recently announced that Parkion, a global leader in this industry, has been awarded the contract to design and deliver the new ticketing system in partnership with TransLink. Improvements will be seen from 2018 onwards. Ian Milne for supplementary. Can I ask the Minister, uh, will the integrated ticketing also be available uh, on a north-south basis? I thank the member for his supplementary. And the, the member no doubt will be aware that whereas there is joint services currently on offer across the island, uh, we, we currently do not have the ability to have joint ticketing arrangements. Uh, this facility, while not directly creating the opportunity for integrated ticketing straight away certainly has the scope uh, to, to do so. It's something that I will be picking up with Southern counterparts as we go forward um, and certainly want to engage in a positive way on the way forward. Eremer, Daniel McCrossan. I call Daniel McCrossan. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy. Principal Speaker, um, I would just like to ask the Minister what plans he has to incorporate the needs of post-primary um, children who use trains who aren't eligible for um, free transport, what, how he, he plans to incorporate that into the new ticketing system? At this stage in the development, it's not something that we have specifically looked at, uh, but you know, the member has raised an issue here that I think is, is warrants further discussion and further scoping. You know, we want to have a, a shift from the car to rail. We want to expand our rail services, and there's certainly a need that I, that I want to be able to meet. And part of that, of course, is those children who are travelling to school and the opportunities that exist by rail. So it's something I will look at in the months ahead. I, I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Can the Minister give your assessments um, of the students' travel concessions and especially for those at university, and whether present he thinks that those concessions are reasonable. 
Certainly. Well, I, I think concessionary furs is something that's very, very important to us. It's something the executive has protected year on year. Um, you know, we spend some forty odd million pound per year when we look at concessionary furs. Uh, so the student furs is something I think is very valuable. There are young people who feel financial pressures from a large number of corners. And if we can do whatever we can in public transport to be able to alleviate some of this pressure, it's something I'd be more than happy to work on in the future. I call Steve Aiken. May I thank the Minister for his comments? And I'm delighted to see that the smart card is going to be rolled out. But why is it going to take until 2018 for it to be rolled out when, if we look at what's happened in the Republic of Ireland and what's happened in the rest of the United Kingdom, Leap cards and Oyster cards have been rolled out in a much shorter period of time? On a particular note, of course, there are many Northern Ireland companies that are involved in the development of both Leak Card and Smart Card or, and Oyster Card technology. And I would like the Minister to assure us that everything can be done to improve the timescale and delivery of this project, because as I'm sure as the Minister is aware, by 2018, and technology will have moved on. Well, I'm sure the Member will be well aware that due to operational complexities of the project and the, and the, the need for wider uh, consumer and customer educational experience, and the staff training technology enhancements will be in phased in a, in a longer run in. Uh, I think this will give us a far greater adoption of the new era in the Translink ticketing. Uh, this is not about leaving people behind. I think there has to be a message that you still will be able to use cash. I know there are some people out there who think we're going entirely cashless. It's not going to be the case at all. Uh, so I think there's an education process involved in this. Uh, and the advancement, of course, of the Belfast Rapid Transit uh, will be very, very important as we start to roll out these. I call Philip Smith. Question six, please. A significant amount of work has been completed on the A24 Ball and Hinch bypass to progress the scheme through the preliminary options, preferred option, and proposed option scheme assessments. This work enabled publication of the environmental statement, draft direction, and draft vesting orders in March 2015. The former Department for Regional Development received a number of objections during the statutory consultation period for the draft orders and it was determined appropriate to convene a public inquiry to examine the case for and against the proposed scheme. The inquiry was held on the 26th and 27th of January 2016. The inspector's report of the inquiry was subsequently received in March 2016, and my department's project development team have considered the report and recommendations and are currently finalising a report for my consideration. Philip Smith. Subject to a satisfactory outcome, my department will publish the environmental statement notice of intention to proceed and make the direction order for the proposed scheme. I expect the making of the vesting order for the scheme will be delayed to align with the construction programme for the bypass. Philip Smith for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer. Um, when do you believe that the department will be in a, a position to respond to the inspector's report? And will funding be allocated for this essential and long overdue project uh, in the upcoming four year capital budget? Well, I thank the member for his question. I thank the member for raising the, the, the issue. Uh, as someone who uh, comes from that part of the world, uh, I would be more than delighted to be able to fund the construction of this uh, very important project in the morning. I think, as you've alluded to, it's something that uh, the local population and certainly the, the population of the Strangford and South Down area uh, have been looking for for the, for the best part of half a century. Actually, local campaigners have been campaigning for this. I expect the report to be with me very shortly, uh, and certainly the financial situation. And whereas this project is not a flagship uh, programme for the department, it's certainly something that's very, very important, something I want to see delivered. I call David Hilditch. Seven. The replacement of the water main at North Road commenced at the beginning of July and was scheduled to take 14 weeks. From January 2016, NI Water has been in continuous contact with all key stakeholders, including elected representatives, schools, private households and businesses, to minimise the impact locally. Impacts such as traffic management and providing sufficient local access were key priorities to the works programme. The initial phase saw a single lane closure at Prince Andrew Way Junction, followed by a full road closure in both directions from Prince Andrew Way Junction to Middle Road. However, this resulted in problems for a number of businesses at the top of North Road in Oakland Park, and their concerns were raised during a meeting between a number of local representatives, NI Water and Transport NI. As a result of these discussions, NI Water agreed to reopen a single lane to allow access to the area. I am happy to report that the work is now substantially complete, and there are no further full road closures proposed. 
The remaining work to connect the existing customers to the new water main and sewer pipe can generally be carried out on the road verge and footway. The scheme is expected to be complete by the end of October, well within the original programme. I would like to thank local businesses and the wider community for their patience and cooperation while this essential work was carried out. And, uh, there is no time for uh, supplementary, so that ends the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Um, the member listed for topical question number one has withdrawn their name. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister may be aware of the recent creation of a, a, a lengthy stretch of joint pedestrian and cycle pathway on Bangor Ring Road between Grancher Road and Donaghadee Road. Last week, directional arrows uh, accompanied by the outline drawings of a cycle were painted at regular intervals along this pathway. They direct cyclists to ride on the right-hand side of the cycle pathway as opposed to the accepted rule of the road to ride or drive on the left-hand side. Was this human error, or is there some technical reason for this departure from the Highway Code? I thank the member for his very topical question. Uh, the member will no doubt understand that I would have to see uh, some images of what he, he is talking about. Uh, to certainly to get a good grasp of the situation and to be more than happy to, to sit down with the member to, and to have a look at it. I call Alan Chambers for supplementary. Thank you very much. I certainly have the images here and uh, they are causing a bit of fun in the Bangor area. Um, in terms of uh, the, the pathway, the cyclists are reluctant uh, to use this particular uh, carriageway due to the amount of road debris and stones been thrown up by vehicles using the, the very busy ring road. And I would ask the Minister uh, what measures have been put in place or his department could put in place uh, to address this problem going forward. I thank the member for his supplementary and certainly you've touched upon a very important issue and that is the, the, the confidence and the ability of local people to go out onto their bicycle to commute to, uh, and to take to our roads in a manner in which they feel safe and in a manner in which they are safe. Uh, it's an issue that I have certainly been aware of since coming into post. Uh, I will be publishing my Greenway strategy very shortly uh, and a bicycle network plan for Belfast. And certainly the, the wish of myself and the department would be to have as much segregated cycling pathways as possible. Uh, of course, this is, you know, all comes down to finances at the end of the day. And very often, you know, we have situations where the, the, the mixed cycling and pedestrian and vehicular traffic roads are more than safe. Uh, but it, certainly the message has to go out to all road users to be well aware uh, of those road users beside them, be it pedestrians, be it cyclists, and indeed those people in cars, and to have a little bit more respect for everybody that uses the road. I call Danny Kennedy. Sir, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, given the, <coughs> the huge financial pressure experienced by both local ratepayers and taxpayers over many years in maintaining the airport at Eglinton, City of Derry Airport at Eglinton, uh, will the Minister and the Executive uh, consider the option of the airport being sold into the private sector where regional airports are normally placed? Thank the member for his question. And to be very blunt, no, it's not something that I have thought of or likely to give much consideration to in the near future. Danny Kennedy for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Principal Deputy Speaker. Surely, Minister, any, any responsible minister and any responsible executive should look at least look at the option in order to, uh, to, uh, to include uh, private management of that airport so that jobs can be protected to what is an essential uh, sub-regional airport. I will repeat, if the, if the option is sitting in front of me, of course I will look at it, but the option is not sitting in front of me. I call Gary Middleton. Yeah, Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister provide an update on what progress has been made on the A6 road scheme? I think with the A6, uh, you know, it's important to say that when we went to the vesting orders a number of weeks ago, uh, we were at a stage where we were launching uh, the A6 and you know, speaking to people in the northwest, we're delighted to have got to here. And we're talking, of course, the Randallstown to the Castle Dawson roundabout. Um, and delighted to announce also that uh, in the years ahead, we're going to see on work continues to advance on a Dungiven bypass towards the city. Uh, the vesting orders and the period for vesting orders will close next week and construction then will begin in the month of October. 
Gary Middleton for supplement. Okay, uh, thank the Minister for his response. And he, he will be aware uh, that uh, infrastructure in the North West is very important to our local economy. And of course, we welcome uh, the announcement uh, by the Executive, Executive Office today in relation to uh, the airport. Uh, but can the Minister outline whether he foresees any issues which could possibly delay uh, the upgrade of the A6? Well, I think it's important to stress with any large infrastructure project, there are, there are always issues that may delay or uh, you know, may um, cause you problems. And certainly, it, you know, the A6 as well as the A5 and any large infrastructure project we look to go forward uh, is certainly something that you know, is, is going to likely to happen. Uh, my office has received notification this, this week of the intention um, of the possibility of, of legal action in regard to the A6 and it's something that myself and the officials are working through. I call Paul Garvin. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, as a representative of the premier town of Northern Ireland, Ballyclare, uh, I want to ask uh, in relation to the infrastructure problems we have associated with uh, the proposed relief road and uh, the time factor in delivering of that. Is there any work being undertaken by the department to look at alleviation problems for both Ballyclare and Doak? Uh, in the interim. I thank the member for his question. It, it, it's an, an issue certainly as close to his heart. We, we have chatted about this particular issue uh, and, we'll, and as I've outlined before, whereas there's no specific work uh, going on looking at the, the distributor road that you refer to, uh, it's something I'm more than happy to correspond with the member on uh, as we go forward in the years ahead. Paul Garvin for supplementary. Thank, th I thank the Minister for for his answer thus far, but on the basis of uh, the difficulties that we're having uh, and associated with uh, the relief road, it could take anything up to 15 years for the development to take place. Uh, is there any possibility that uh, engagement could be taken on with the local authority to take the lead in delivering of such a major project and taking the lead, but with some payback from the development uh, as it goes forward? I would agree. I think there's a number of uh, locations throughout the north where local councils actually stand in prime position to play a leading role following the devolution of various powers to local councils in recent years uh, and their capacity for financial borrowing, for, to give one example. I think certainly in conjunction with the department or on their own, uh, with local developers certainly, uh, there is the potential to look at this. There are a large number of towns uh, where congestion is maybe a problem and certainly my department will do whatever they can to alleviate uh, to look at our strategic road network but there are places as well that local council can play that role uh, and I have no doubt certainly going forward I will be doing my best to work in partnership with them. I call Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Principal Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer so far. In relation to road maintenance following heavy flooding last winter the Minister's predecessor announced a one million package uh, for, to improve flood alleviation measures and drainage on key Fermanagh roads. Can the Minister provide me with an update on this work to date? Well, I don't have the specifics around the update on the specific roads that you talked about. Certainly coming into position, uh, it was very clear to me that rural roads in particular are something that needed attention. I was delighted to be able to secure the funding to be able to roll out a rural roads initiative where a thousand rural roads uh, will be involved in a scheme that would see resurfacing. Some drainage works, of course, would take place also, which is very, very important. Divisions, local divisions have been carrying out this work to date and will continue in the months ahead. Richie McPhillips for supplementary. I thank you, the Minister, for the answer. Uh, as we approach another, approach another winter, there are many residents and road users raising concerns with me on a daily basis of, of the con about the condition of the roads and the state that they will be in a few months. What assurances can the Minister give that planned work will be completed in a timely manner? Certainly, you know, as divisions roll out their works programme, it's very important they do so in a, in a timely way. Uh, for want of a better phrase, you get better bang for your buck, of course, when you do it when the weather is better. You know, carrying out such works in the winter is not productive, both for the department and for local communities, as you suggest. Aaron or Declan Kearney. I call Declan Kearney. Can I ask you the following question? Does the Minister have an assessment of the potential EU funding that is likely to be lost to his department arising from the Brexit decision? 
My department established a Brexit unit in July. The unit has engaged with a number of key stakeholders to identify the most critical issues of concern and to fully understand how these concerns can most effectively be addressed. Only last week, my department met with officials from the Brexit unit in the Department for Transport in London and colleagues from other devolved administrations. This provided a useful platform upon which to raise awareness of our unique circumstances and challenges, and they have asked my officials to remain active in this respect. I remain determined to pursue all opportunities available to us as members of the European Union. As the overall framework for Brexit begins to take shape, we will continue to actively participate in the European arena. In that regard, we will continue to prepare and present applications for EU funding for our major projects where we can. For my department, it is business as usual. Declan Kearney for supplementary. Uh, flowing from your uh, answer to my earlier question, Minister, could you detail how you intend to prioritise direct uh, engagement with the European institutions in themselves in order to ensure that current funding uh, levels are maintained and that we do not lose our special status as a region with the European Union? Certainly, and I thank the member for his question. You know, when this news broke, uh, on the 23rd and the 24th of June, uh, say it was important that all departments in the executive, of course the department is nature of infrastructure, continue to engage directly with Europe. I had been to Rotterdam to attend tea transport conferences before that, seeing with my very own eyes the opportunities exist going forward. Uh, I've met with the EU Commission uh, in, the, in the weeks in, 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 in leading on from that. Uh, today I have met with representatives from uh, Flanders. It is something that I am going to continue to do in the weeks ahead. But as outlined in my original answer to you, for myself and for my department, it is a case of business as usual. Um, we, we must not let this uh, tidal wave of bad news, certainly when it comes to my department and Brexit, overcome us. We, you know, we must stand our important infrastructure projects if we are to prioritise places like the North West, if we are to continue the modal shift from the car to the rail. It's important that we do so from a position of business as usual. Trevor Lunn is not in his place. Um, Alec Atwood has withdrawn question number nine. Iremer Ian Milne. I call Ian Milne. Could I ask the Minister to give us an update on the, uh, uh, on the completion of the Marafelt uh, bypass? Yes, I'm delighted uh, to announce that the, the Marafelt bypass will be open shortly, uh, and I will be uh, in that part of the world to, to meet with the divisional team and to, and to see the project with your own eyes uh, and to do so in the next couple of weeks. Ian Millen for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister also. Um, could I ask then the Minister uh, to outline his thoughts uh, and the benefits that this bypass there will give, not just to the Marafelt area, but the Greater Mid Ulster area, and bearing in mind, uh, hopefully, in the, in the future, the A6? I thank the member for, for his question. And as as alluded to in, in answer to, 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 the, to those in the, the benches opposite earlier, there are a number of towns and locations throughout the north where congestion in, in these uh, regional towns uh, is bad news for the local economy, it's bad news for local traders uh, who, who want to see the congestion alleviated, who want to see cars flowing in and out, not just for the air quality, of course, but to, for the local economy. Uh, so it's something I think the wider Marfelt area will, will be interested in. Coming into post, I was very clear that I wanted to tackle an historical infrastructural uh, deficit when it comes to, to the west, especially west of the band. Uh, and whereas the Maherfeld Bypass, of course, has been in the system for years, I think it's an example of the sort of project we want to see rolled out. There are other towns, in the, the likes of Cookstown, the likes of Enniskillen, that need similar investment going forward. The next item on the order.